I was born Leslie Jacob Wagner. I despised the name Leslie. So when I turned 18, I changed it legally. And for the past seven years, I have been Jacob Wagner. I was married to Laura for nearly three years. Her full name was Laura Elizabeth Keys, and she may have been the famed princess's twin. I graduated from college and worked for a cement firm. The corporation purchased new computer equipment, and we taught classes on it. Eight persons sat in a room. We had converted to a temporary classroom and waited for the lecturer to arrive. She strolled in, introduced herself as Laura Keys, and I immediately fell in love. Later, I discovered that three of my other students were also in love. I was the first to approach her during lunchtime and invite her to lunch. She declined all invitations, even mine. In fact, she turned each of us down. We each received her business card during the three days she was there, culminating on the final day of class. We could contact her if we had any questions or concerns about the course we were taking. That was on Wednesday. I waited until the next Monday to call her. This is Laura. I'm not accessible, but please leave your name, phone number, and a brief note, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Hello, Laura. This is Jacob Wagner of the cement industry who taught last week. What problem must I overcome to persuade you to accompany me on a date? That's the type of message I left. She called the following day. Jacob Wagner, how can I help you? I answered when my phone rang. Hello, Jacob. This is Laura. You mentioned that you had an issue. Hello, Laura. Yes, I am hungry and I dislike dining alone. She laughed, producing a wonderful tinkling sound. I can't dine out, but my evenings are free, she explained. That's where it all began. We ate dinner together the rest of the week and on Sunday of the first week. And for the next five or four weeks, we didn't have lunch since she worked out from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. She either ran, swam, or cycled. Her ambition was to compete in the Ironman competition. The Ironman race consisted of a 2.4-mile swim, a 112-mile bike ride, and a 26.2-mile marathon. All three legs needed to be completed in fewer than 17 hours. She was also vegan, so we ate largely quinoa, kale, tofu, brown rice, oats, sweet potatoes, and beans. It took me a long time to adjust to eating this way. We were married 14 months after meeting. She stopped working out during our honeymoon but resumed shortly upon our return. She came in one evening and I was sitting in our living room single chair. She told me that she planned to participate in an Ironman race in Wisconsin next year. It will be her first race, and she will need to train extra harder than usual, but she believes she will be prepared by the time she arrives. I couldn't picture anyone working harder than her, and I didn't see the appeal in upending my life for such a big event. I suppose that everyone aspires to accomplish something extraordinary. I loved my job and strived for perfection, but to a lesser extent than Laura. I was apprehensive to accept her efforts, since I observed her training solely for the purpose of training. Training for an Ironman would more than double her training time, but I still agreed. That's when things began to alter at our house. Instruction expenditures nearly increased after four months of additional instruction. She informed me that she required a trainer. There was someone at her gym who had competed in Ironman and was eager to coach her. Of course, he was not free. His skill came at a significant cost to us. The first thing he did was convince her to leave her job so she could train full-time. She did that without speaking to me. When she quit her employment, our family's budget was suddenly drained. She had a wonderful competition bike, but her coach said it wasn't good enough. So we purchased another. Then she wanted one to utilize in competition. She utilized the other for training. Then he decided she needed a spare bike for the tournament. So we purchased another one. In total, she had four bicycles. Their total cost equaled that of my two-year-old truck. Time was running short, so I decided it was time to see her trainer. So I went to the gym. I recognized his name, Jason Hendricks, because I wrote checks every week. I saw them at the gym. He was standing over her while she was doing weights, touching her in an unusual way, and it felt like she was seducing him. I watched for a few more minutes before they moved on to the next activity. I'm not sure what it is called or if it has a name, but it's the one where you pull ropes away from the wall. There were weights linked to the ropes, and you could add or subtract weight as needed. Laura stood with her back to the wall, holding the rope handles. Hendricks was facing her and standing very close to her. I watched her pull the rope twice before approaching them. She pulled, and her hands were just in front of her, holding the weights on the ground. Why are you playing with my wife? I inquired and terrified both of them. Jacob, what are you doing here? 
Laura asked. I said, I thought it was time I met Mr. Hendricks. He extended his hand for a handshake, but I simply looked at him, ignoring the hand. He was around three inches taller than me and weighed at least pound thirty more. You don't have the right to touch her like that. Then I will be unable to properly train her. You must touch her breast. The trainer. What type of training is that? This is exactly what I do. Then we'll find someone to train her discreetly. Laura, your services are no longer necessary. I will see you at home. I walked away. Jacob, Jacob, come back. She almost yelled after me. I continued walking, got into my car and drove home. She burst into the house right after I arrived. What the heck are you doing? She asked. You cannot terminate him for performing his job like hell. I cannot. I saw the entire thing. He was simply analyzing my pecs. I laughed aloud. Jesus, Laura, you cannot believe he is analyzing your pecs, my buttocks. And you stood there and allowed him. You even smiled. He is not fired. I need him. You cannot be serious. Yes, I can. He is staying. I gazed at her. Then you can have him, but I don't want any of it. I will not pay him a cent, and if you insist on keeping him, I will not pay for the remainder of your tuition. She stared at me. Then I'll acquire a job, but he will remain my trainer. I paused for a moment before speaking. How essential is it to you? Extremely. And how significant is this to me? You are my hubby. But how significant is this to me? I told you that I don't want you to work out with him. But you urge that he continue. So... Where do I stand on your priority list? And where do I stand on your priority list? If you won't let me train for what I truly want to achieve, I understand and support you. But I don't understand what you're letting him do. You are my wife, and I will not tolerate that. He's out, so get another coach. I want to succeed at Wisconsin, and he can help me. She crossed her arms and stared at me stubbornly. How about performing well in our marriage? Is this Iron Man more significant than that? She gazed at me then turned, uncrossed her arms, and began to say something before changing her mind and heading upstairs. I decided that was sufficient response. I sat there bewildered for a few minutes, assuming my guesses were correct. She had already made up her mind, so all I needed to do was come up with my own answer. I went over to the computer to take care of the money. Things I'd heard should be addressed in the event of marital issues. I figured I'd finish it before she did. That idiot will not get a dollar of my money. If she wants to continue paying him to screw her over, she may do so with her portion, and unmarried. We had a fifth-wheel camper that I used during the summers while in college. Laura and I used to drive to the mountains where she could cycle and run. She claimed it was a better workout that way than on the flatlands. I went upstairs and found her in the bathroom. I could hear her speaking to someone, but all I could make out was, See you tomorrow. I grabbed my clothing and went to the campsite. I made three more excursions and received what I sought on the second one. I heard water in the bathroom and knew she'd be there for at least an hour. She enjoyed lounging in the tub after a long day, especially since most of her clothes were stored in the RV. I packed up the PC and other personal belongings. I spent the night in our office's parking lot. The next morning, I updated my employer. He inquired what my plans were and I responded I didn't have any yet. In the evening, I came by to check if I needed anything else. Laura was eating coleslaw. I entered the area we used as an office and began looking through folders and books. She went in and began observing me. Where were you yesterday night? She asked. It was the first night we had spent apart since our marriage. I stayed in the factory. What have you done? I invited Hendricks over to evaluate your pecs. That was unnecessary, but was this true? No. There was a long pause as she watched me set down what I intended to take. What are you doing now? She asked. Leaving? Why? Because you made it apparent last night that he means more to you than I do. I told you I wanted to do well at Wisconsin, and I can't do it without his assistance. Are you saying no other coach can do what he does? We work well together. I've seen how well you operate together. He caresses you, and you smile. I told you that he doesn't fondle me. I simply shook my head. You and I were a good team once. We are still capable. Please give me that chance. Are you going to give up on him as coach? She shakes her head. No, then I'll leave. I gathered my belongings and headed for the door. When are you coming back? I turned to face her. It's up to you. Tell me he's finished and I'll stay. But tell me he's staying and I'll leave forever. I won't be back. She didn't hesitate. He will stay. What a thing to say. 
One of us was quite selfish. Perhaps both of us were. I wanted a wife, and she wanted to compete. It took three visits to load the rest of my belongings into my truck. She saw me make all three journeys. On the third, she inquired as to my intended destination. I have no idea. When will you be back? She had posed that issue once previously, and I assumed we had already covered it. We have previously discussed it. I'm not planning on returning, Jacob. You can't do that because of my coach, and you can't pick your coach over me. But it appears you do. I grabbed half of our money and charged you to our credit cards. Your phone should have been unplugged. I checked my watch around 30 minutes ago. The utility bills and renter's insurance are due next week. Your car insurance is valid for another four months. I propose that you acquire a job soon or you'll be in serious financial problems. I loaded the last load into my pickup and headed to the garage. Her bike and spare were present. They were packaged in shipping crates that cost nearly as much as the bikes themselves. I grabbed them up one at a time and physically flung them in my truck. She ran as soon as she spotted me. What are you doing now? Cannot you pick them up? She shouted. Heck, I can't. I paid for them. I got into my pickup and drove off. She wasn't sad that I was leaving, but the thought of losing the motorcycles was unbearable for her. The next morning, I drove by to see if she was at the gym. I looked inside and noticed her and Hendrix sitting on the bench press. She was crying, and he was holding her hand. I'm not sure if she was crying because our marriage appeared to be ending or because I had taken away her favorite motorcycles. The following day, I took the day off to find a site for my five-wheeler. I paid a month in advance and signed up for their services. The following day, I spoke with my parents and updated them on the situation. Are you okay? Mom asked. Do you need money? Dad asked. I responded. Yes and no, respectively. Laura and I did not communicate for two weeks. Eventually, she called. I didn't recognize the number and did not respond. She left a message stating that she wanted to talk. I called her. What will we do next? She asked. Do you still practice with Hendrix? Yes, I need him. Then it's time for us to attend divorce court. You cannot be serious. Have you had any fun with him yet? How do you ask that? Easy. I have seen it all. The next natural step is to get you into bed. So, once again, the question is rational. Have you had any fun with him yet? She ended the conversation. The next day, my manager informed me that we had a position at a factory in Leadville, Colorado. If I was interested, I agreed and left for Colorado the following day. I was gone for around two months. It had already dropped in Colorado and winter was approaching. Anyone with a sane mind would not want to spend the winter in a small fifth-wheel trailer. So I rented an apartment and purchased cheap old furniture to decorate. I had no idea what to do with all that space after living in a fifth wheel. My parents and siblings wanted me to return home for Thanksgiving. So I went. By then, I had returned to my normal eating habits. No quinoa, kale, or tofu. Not that the foods were horrible, but they were not to my liking. Spending the vacation with my family was enjoyable. Nobody missed Laura. The day following Thanksgiving, I returned to Leadville. I had lunch with my parents and was preparing to depart town. I was filling up my pickup with gas when an old acquaintance noticed me. We started conversing, and he informed me he saw Laura with a strong guy hanging out together. We stopped at a small cafe near the petrol station and had our coffee. He told me about Laura and Hendrix. They were seen openly holding hands in the mall and walking down the street. They were often seen kissing in public. My friend Zeke, short for Ezekiel, was conversing when his phone rang. It was his brother, and they were planning to go hunting the next morning before Zeke's brother, Emmanuel, had to go for work. I told Zeke it was time for me to leave, but he held out his hand and asked me to wait. He said, Have you seen Laura Wagner lately? A pause. Yeah, Jake has a wife. Pause. You're getting on my nerves right now. Okay, thanks. I'm with Jake right now, and we'll probably come over. Thanks. What was that about? I asked. You won't believe this, but Laura and her boyfriend have checked into Emma's motel. They have been there for two days. He clarified what he meant. They aren't there right now. The motel is not the best, thus there is no restaurant. M thinks they departed for dinner, so they'll probably return shortly. Probably in the gym. I assumed we had dragged ourselves to the motel. Zeke is in his car, and I have mine. I parked in the furthest corner of the parking lot. I knew him, so he had no trouble assisting us. 
By the way, none of our cameras are working, he explained. Even the outside cameras are broken, so don't be concerned about being captured. He grinned as he said that. Why do you work somewhere like this? I asked him. I own the place and earn more each month than the Hampton Inn. Laura and her partner, by the way. His name is Jason Hendricks. Come here. At least one night per week. They are unable to visit his home because he is married, and she stays with her parents after being kicked out of your former residence. Jake, Jake, Jacob, Jason. She must prefer males named Jay. They enter here and do their thing. They had been here for two days because his wife spent Thanksgiving with her family in North Carolina or elsewhere. I overheard them laughing that he didn't accompany his wife. They came here since he is scared to take her to his home. Too many nosy neighbors. They'll go tomorrow when his wife returns. Give us the keys to their room. We will get it back now. Zeke spoke to his brother and, without thinking, held out the key. The motel still had room keys, not those small cards. Zeke and I headed inside their room. It was clear what was going on there. Okay, Jake, that is your responsibility. I will take pictures outside. And you snap pictures indoors. Are you certain? And won't you get into trouble? I asked. He told you that he owns the establishment. He does not tolerate prostitutes. And yet, he makes a lot of money. If he revealed everything he knows about the many people who spend hours here several times each week, there would be controversies by now. The police no longer respond to calls about this location. Mind your own business, and I will mind mine. Their room was located in the back of the motel on the second story, overlooking the construction site. It had a very little balcony, and I made certain that the balcony door was unlocked and not functional. I went outside, downstairs, and asked him for a ladder. He showed me where his tool shed was and instructed me to help myself. Several ladders hung outside the shed. I took an extension ladder that appeared long enough to reach the second floor and attempted it. It worked, so I went to my truck to wait. Zeke contacted me about 30 minutes later, saying they had just returned and he was about to start snapping shots. It was already totally dark. I looked up, waited for the lights to turn on in the room, exited the vehicle, walked over and climbed the stairs. They made no move to close the curtain. As I stood on the steps, I took photos of them carelessly stepping out of their exercise clothing. On rare times, they looked toward the balcony. I ducked my head so they wouldn't notice me. Laura would never do this without first taking a shower, so they went directly there. They left the restroom door open, but that was fine. The shower was a combination tub and shower constructed into the wall, so they couldn't leave the bathroom while using either. I went to work. I had two overnight bags and packed all of their clothes in them. All of them. I also took a few items from the rack on the wall outside the bathroom door. I threw it all out the window to ensure that I had everything. I even peeked into the bathroom to see if there were any shorts or t-shirts. There were none. Even crawling on my stomach into the bathroom, I grabbed every towel and tissue I could find. I even took the bathroom mat. I could hear them conversing in the shower, but I couldn't understand anything. I was aware that the curtain was blocking their view of me. Everything, including the bedding, was thrown over onto the balcony. I went downstairs and carried everything into my pickup. The occupants in the room just below Laura's were watching me. I looked at them, tapped the ring finger on my left hand, pointed to the room above them, and then to my heart. I clutched my hands together, making a broken-hearted gesture. The man placed his thumb and index finger to his mouth, swirled them, and made a throwing motion as if to close his lips and discard the key. This meant they would not say anything. Most likely one or both of them were cheating on their spouse, thus they refused to discuss. I greeted Zeke and Emma at the front desk. I handed them the blankets I'd brought with me. The brothers glanced at one other, laughed, and had already printed off copies of Zika's photo. We knew we were running out of time and had just started printing my photos. When the front desk phone rang, he peeked to see which room it was from and winked at us. Front desk. A pause. Really? Pause. You say the steps are still there? Pause. So stay where you are. I will supply additional towels and sheets. I can't do anything about your clothing or personal items, but I will contact the police. They will be here shortly. A pause. There are no cops, but I need to because somebody stole your clothes. Pause. Okay, if you insist, I will not call them, but all I can offer is some towels. Pause. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Aside from one minor issue, I hope you enjoyed your stay. When he returned the tube to the stand, 
all three of us began laughing. Staying where you are, it is the funniest thing I have heard in years. I said, we were still laughing. I asked if I might take them some new towels and linens. That prompted another round of laughs. If that's what you truly desire, he said. He walked away and returned with a stack of goods. I took them and headed upstairs. I knocked on the door, room service. I cried out, the door ajar. I'll take them, Hendricks replied. I ignored him and pushed him away, muscles and all. She stared at me, shook her head, and covered herself with one of the new sheets. Meanwhile, Hendricks stood in the center of the room, unsure whether to shed himself or go blind. I looked at Laura. Laura, you have clearly not analyzed his chest. He needs assistance. She finally discovered her non-shouting voice. What? How? Why? Don't try, Laura. It will not make a difference. I will be in town long enough to file for divorce. Good luck in Wisconsin. Jacob, Jacob, please. I didn't bother to close the door as I left. Hendricks did not move during my entire stay in the room. She had tried to reach me and left multiple messages. I had both her and his phones, so she had to use the motel phone. The substance of her texts was that I had dumped her, and she needed him for help with the learning process and subsequently for emotional support. After I left, I decided to stay in town late to begin the divorce proceedings. It took two days to sort through the clothes I had removed from their room. I discovered Hendrix's wallet, keys, phone, and a bunch of other belongings. Among them was a little black notebook. It was filled with addresses, names, phone numbers, and genders. Laura was rated a six on a ten-point scale, and she subsequently told me that a few hours after I left, a man gave them some items probably close. When they checked out the following morning, they both wore ill-fitting sportswear. The dude must have also brought Hendrix's car key. When I returned to Leadville that morning, I visited the Hendrix house. Mrs. Hendrix was present. I handed her his clothes, other personal items, and copies of the photographs Zeke and I had shot. The photo of Zeke showed them heading into the motel hand in hand. There were no explicit images, but it didn't take a strong imagination to figure out what was going on. She became interested in his small black book at the last minute. I also handed her Laura's stuff. Maybe you may phone her and ask if she wants those items returned, I told her while giggling. It had been approximately two hours since I had parted ways with Mrs. Hendricks, and I was traveling down the highway towards Leadville when the phone rang. Hello, Jacob. I'm so sorry, but you broke up with me. Let's meet and speak about it and bring my bikes when you get here. She definitely missed her bikes. It was a big disappointment because I had already sold them in Leadville. Screw you. So I hung up the phone. My immediate supervisor, who was also the plant manager, was hosting a Christmas party for the entire plant. I knew the difference between gin and bourbon, so I offered to serve the bar. The party was hosted at his house, and the bar was staffed more efficiently than some legitimate bars I'd seen. It was around 8 p.m., and the place was already busy. I was merely taking a break to go to the bathhouse, but I was having as much fun as everyone else. One of the guests brought me a dish of food and placed it on the bar. You should take a rest and eat. She stated she had previously visited the bar numerous times that evening, and we talked for a bit. Thank you, I said. She sat on one of the stools at the small bar. The remaining forty or so people were distributed throughout the massive basement. Many of them sat around the fireplace, laughing and telling jokes. Other people were dancing. The woman who delivered the lunch and I were the only ones doing nothing. Or rather, we were preoccupied. I was eating and she was observing me. My name is Diana. Diana Webster. She commented, I've been watching you, and you don't seem to mind missing the majority of the party. I wiped my hands on a tea towel and held out my right hand to shake. Jacob Wagner. I said, And I bet I have more fun than most of these people. You never know what some customers say to their bartender. I laughed as I said it. She also laughed. Do you work in a factory? She said. Yes, do you? No, I do not. I'm an accountant and a neighbor. So they invite me to all of their gatherings. Are there many of them? Not too many. Three or four per year. However, they are typically good ones and some of them can be quite rowdy. And this one? No, they're quiet around Christmas. But the 4th of July celebrations are wild. I haven't worked for him long, but he seems like a nice guy. I told her that he is. He and Amber are awesome, and I love them to death. I still had food on my plate, and someone requested drinks for their group, so Diane took care of it. Thanks, I asked. Do you know your way around a bar? She laughed. 
I uncorked a few bottles. Jonathan and Amber Whittemore served as our evening host and hostess. I loved working with and for him. He knew all about the plant where we made cement, the mine where we blasted the quarry, where we extracted most of the stone, and the transportation system that included both railroad and trucks. I was fortunate that he took me under his wing as soon as we met. I became his assistant, and it was a role that appealed to me. Shortly after I was done with the plate of food Diane had brought me, I was relieved of my bartending duties by another guest. Take a break and dance with this lovely lady, he said, pointing to Diana. I handed him my bar towel, stepped out from behind the bar and bowed to Diana, who curtsied back. We both laughed and walked to the small dance floor. Our bodies immediately drew closer together and stayed that way for three songs. At the end of the third song, we stopped and looked at each other, in the interest of full disclosure. I have to tell you, I married. I said, and she took a step back. Is she here tonight? No. And it's a long story, but I can tell it real quick. Good. I'd like to hear it. She said we both got our drinks and she led me upstairs to the living room. She sat down on the couch and indicated for me to sit next to her. Okay, tell me about this marriage, I narrated. When I got to the sentence about stealing their clothes, she almost fell to the floor with laughter. When she finally stopped, she asked, So when's the divorce? I filed after Thanksgiving, so it'll take a few months. I took a sip of my drink. What's your story? About the same as yours. Except my husband didn't need a coach for sports. He already knew how to do it and regularly practiced with the waitresses at some of the local bars. I never caught him, but it's a small town and someone snitched on him. That was a little over a year ago. How is divorce living for you? I asked. It's still new. We've only been divorced for five months. The problem is that all sorts of creeps think that because I'm divorced, I'm easy. I laughed. I had a feeling she wasn't to be trifled with. We sat and talked until Amber Whittemore told us it was time to go home. I walked her to the house next door and we shook hands for the night. Two days later, I walked into my boss's office and bluntly asked him for Diane's phone number. I'm not authorized to give it to you without her permission, but I'll give her your number and she can do whatever she wants with it, if that's okay with you. I was fine with that. She called three days later. We talked for a long time and ended up giving me her number. After that, we talked to each other often. Our first date was two days before Christmas. We had dinner, danced a little, and I drove her home. She was spending Christmas with her family. I spent it at my apartment around 530 on Christmas Eve. My doorbell rang. It was Diane. Would you like some company? She asked. Sure, I replied as she walked in with a small basket. She set it on the table and started pulling out food, turkey, ham, potatoes, all the usual Christmas dinner stuff. I told my folks that you must be alone and starving. So mom made all this for you. Thank her for me. It looks very appetizing. She set a plate for both of us, and we sat in eight talking the whole time. Afterward, we shared our cleaning experience. Later, we sat on my couch with eggnog and still talked. I learned that her husband works at the best hardware store in town. When she told me his name, I recognized him. I made it a habit to deal with him whenever I went into that store. I liked him. They had been married three years when they divorced. I told her I thought he was a nice guy. Yes, he is. We're still friends, but he's a cheater. And I can't stand cheaters. Let me ask you a personal question. If it's none of my business, tell me. I sighed. Your ex-husband works at a hardware store and you're an accountant. How can you afford to live next door to the Whitmores? She chuckled. Thanks to my parents, or rather my grandparents, they owned the land on which this neighborhood was built. My house was the first one built there, and they used it as a model for the others. When all the lots were sold and all the houses were built, they gave it to me. Nice grandparents. Where do they live? They have a small ranch in the Texas Highlands. They came to my parents' house for Christmas. As a matter of fact, I just left them. It was past midnight when she decided to leave. I walked her to her car and discovered about four inches of new snow. I was unaccustomed to snow and was anxious that she might drive in it. Of course, she had been driving on it her entire life, but this was the first time I had seen it in the winter. It's not a huge deal, she responded as we swept the most of the snow off her car. The snow plows do not come out until there are around six inches of snow on the ground. I'll be all right. She put her hand on my shoulder, drew me close, and kissed me. Merry Christmas, and I'll phone you when I arrive home. If you desire that, please call. I said, 
and kissed her back. It was basically our second date and first kiss. Our third date was on New Year's Eve when we attended a party at her parents' home. She introduced me to her parents, brother, sister, and spouses. We didn't have time to talk because the celebration was so crowded, so I got a drink and socialized. Her grandparents were in Texas, but there were around 50 other people present, including my employer and his wife. He remarked, You must be doing something right, Jacob. Being invited to this gathering is something unique. I agree. Hi, Mr. Whitmore. Hello, this is Jonathan, he responded. When we get away from the factory. His wife stated that an amber is any time you see me at the party. Diane was almost invisible to me. She was helping her parents. Every time I tried to help, I was encouraged to relax and enjoy the celebration. I did. Thank you to the Whitmores. They introduced me to numerous couples who, as it turned out, were basically the driving force behind the community. One young woman grew close to me and took personal responsibility for ensuring that I had food and water. She gave her name as Rosita Cameron. After about an hour, I became bored with her and started looking for a way out of her hands. I tried socializing with the Whitmores and others, but I couldn't get rid of Rosie, who had told me to call her. I managed to get away from her while using the restroom, but she must have been waiting for me to emerge because she grabbed my hand and gripped it tightly. I finally had enough and told her I needed to leave. I couldn't see Diane, so I went up to her mother and thanked her before saying goodnight. I took my coat and departed. The next morning, the phone rang. I was already preparing sausages and sipping my second cup of coffee. I looked to see who it was and replied, We wish you a happy new year. How was the celebration? It was nice until mom told me you had departed. The party was spoiled once I became upset. Why did you depart? And why didn't you let me know you were leaving? The primary reason was a young lady named Rosita. She clutched to me, refusing to let go. And every time I saw you, you were busy pouring beverages, holding food trays, or generally being the ideal hostess. I searched for you when I left, but I couldn't find you. And Rosita was clutching my arm as hard as she could. I decided to leave to avoid her. Her demeanor seemed to soften slightly. She is a good friend of mine, and I told her to make sure no woman gets too close to you. She clearly did her job. Nothing could come near to me, yet I did not want her to push you away. We wish you a happy new year. I answered, I also wish you a happy new year, but he'd be happier if you were present. If you wish to join me for breakfast, please let me know. I told her I'd love to, but I had to go see the Rose Parade with my family. We talked some more and decided to meet for dinner three days later, the day before the date. I called to ensure she could make it. Sorry, Jacob, but something came up. She declined to offer another day. I was on my way home that evening when I remembered I needed epoxy to repair a lamp. I was broken, so I stopped by the hardware shop. Diane's ex, my old buddy David Webster, was talking to another customer. Yes, she is coming around. We'll meet up again in two or three dates. I was stupid the first time, and she did not deserve for me to cheat on her. But I've learned a lesson. I'll feel better after dinner tomorrow night. We shall see. Best of luck. Please let me know how things turn out. Sure, I'll tell you. David stated that he turned and spotted me. Hi, Jacob. So what can I do for you? I need epoxy, a tiny one, not the gigantic size of the economy. I haven't used much in ten years. He gave a laugh. I don't see why we need a larger size. We rarely sell them. We approached the register where he counted the earnings. I gave him a twenty. I could not keep my mouth shut. I overheard you talking about supper tomorrow night, attempting to make amends with an old acquaintance. Oh no, I'm trying to reconcile with my ex-wife. I messed up the first time, and now I'm attempting to make amends. Tomorrow is my birthday, and I convinced her to join me for supper. She always made my birthday extra special, if you know what I mean. He gave a laugh. No, I didn't. How does she feel about the possibility of getting back together? I inquired. I'm certain we're friendly enough. We occasionally go out to eat and have enjoyable evenings, if you know what I mean. It was the second time he had used the phrase, if you get what I mean, and the connotation was obvious. Yeah, I believe I understand what you mean. I went home after picking up my epoxy change. She contacted me two days later following supper with her ex-husband's birthday boy. How are you? She inquired. Not that awful. So, how about you? She said, pretty good. I assume your date with David went well? Yes, please wait. How did you find out about it? And how did you know you were with him? It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're seeing him again. He seems to believe you are. In reality, he believes a few more pleasant evenings with you will suffice. 
Diane, how about this? What? A few of more lovely evenings will suffice. And what exactly constitutes a nice evening, according to your definition? Dinner, dancing, cocktails, and a gentle roll in the hay to give him a great birthday gift. My assumption is that you have always given him lovely birthday presents. I also understand that your relationship with your ex must be wonderful. It's not like that, Jacob. How, exactly? We're just talking. Yes, it's always wonderful to have pillow chat. After a long interval, I heard it. Hello, Jacob. I looked down at the dead cell phone in my palm and spoke quietly without addressing anyone. Diane, goodbye. The subsequent two weeks at work were a saving grace. Our equipment was failing. We were lagging in output. We also experienced a labor shortage. Overall, it was an excellent two weeks. But I was busier than a cat scooping garbage. So time flies by. Jonathan and I decided to grab lunch together on the last day of work for the month. We took our seats, placed our orders, and sipped our coffees. What's up with you and Diana? He inquired. She was constantly communicating with Amber, and we assumed everything was well. Then Amber informed me you accused Diane of sleeping with David. Yes, of course. You don't have to tell me about your personal life, but I had a cup of coffee. Well, you see, I got him up to speed. So you didn't specifically accuse her of sleeping with him, you just hinted at it. That is right, as Webster hinted to me. The difficulty is that she did not deny it. That's too bad. He crushed her heart once and he will do so again. She's a huge girl. She'll get past it, I informed him. I hope so, Jonathan answered. The remainder of our lunch was spent on business. He wanted me to travel down to Atlanta in a couple of weeks and persuade our headquarters to grant us two more trucks for the quarry. This would be my first trip to headquarters, and I was really eager. Denver is known as the Mile High City, but Leadville is nearly two miles high, and I'd gladly go away from that chilly mountain for a few days. I was on my way to the Denver airport for a flight to Atlanta. It had been a month since I had spoken with Diane, and I had also moved hardware stores. I didn't like flying. Actually, this was only my fourth flight to Atlanta. I had heard that flying into or out of Denver in the afternoon can be pretty bumpy. This day was no different. We shook for the longest ten minutes of my life immediately after departure. Then I, for one, was pleased when this massive airliner leveled off and glided into Atlanta. We received two extra trucks, but I doubt it was due to my requests. They just realized that they couldn't disagree with the numbers I had compiled. I believe they simply wanted to watch me beg. Jonathan suggested me to visit my folks on the way home, so I took a detour, and I did. I missed the warm temperature in deep South America, especially in February. Although it was freezing in Leadville, it was 68 degrees and sunny in my hometown. My folks met me at the airport and escorted me home with hugs and kisses. We sat about talking about the newest rumor, all except Laura, who we attempted to avoid. My lawyer only called me once regarding the divorce. Laura had only asked for the two bicycles I had sold. I decided to phone him the next day to check how things were progressing. After supper, I called my friend Zeke. We met at one of our favorite places and got cocktails. Laura and Hendricks had apparently moved into an old trailer together. They just had the money he earned as a coach. She was still only coaching. But at the very least, she was receiving it free. They distributed flyers throughout town, asking for sponsorships so she could attend her Ironman in Wisconsin in April. They even appeared on two local TV shows begging for money. But Zeke and a few of my other friends made it clear that they were married. She cheated on her husband and lived with her coach while still married to me. His wife, Hendricks, joined them in condemning the couple, even going on TV to tell how she ended up at their motel. She never mentioned the name of the man who handed her their belongings. EMS Motel even got in on the action and the unprompted publicity began to bring in more customers. What is the end result? Laura had only one sponsor, the gym where she worked out. She received few donations, and they were small. At least, that's what I was told. Of course, only Laura and Hendricks knew for certain. There were also rumors that she became pregnant but had an abortion because she did not want anything to disrupt her training. However, as far as anyone could tell, those were just rumors. The next day, I called my attorney, and he basically told me what I had heard the night before. He also mentioned that our court hearing would most likely be in April and asked if I would be there. Possibly not. I told him it was fine. I will be fine, he said. The following morning, I flew to Denver. 
morning flights to or from Denver are far superior to afternoon flights. According to veteran pilots, this morning was ideal. There isn't a single bump in the sky. I retrieved my truck and drove home. When I arrived home, it was clear and sunny, but much colder than the witch's house. It was too late to check in at the office, so I returned home. I visited the best restaurant in town. I intended to eat dinner, but when I entered and looked for a seat, I noticed Diana sitting with a man. His back was turned to me, so I couldn't see who it was. I determined it was David. Our eyes met for a moment, after which I turned and walked away. In my apartment, I prepared meatloaf and opened a beer. As I climbed into bed, I heard the wind blow. Wind in the mountains is common. Seventy miles per hour through the peaks was not uncommon. And any snow on the ground was blowing like crazy. My last thought before bed was how nice it would be to have someone to cuddle with. When I got out of bed the next morning, my apartment was warm. Of course, outside all the windows were covered in ice. I hoped I wouldn't have to go to the quarry that day. Later that afternoon in Jonathan's office, I told him about my trip. He congratulated me on acquiring two trucks. Honestly, I didn't think we'd get them. He said, you must have impressed someone. Good job. Thanks. Back my office. I went about the work that had accumulated during my absence. That evening of the same day, I returned to the diner. Diane or no Diane. I wanted a good meal and their coffee. The best I had ever tasted. I ordered my dinner and cupped my hands around my coffee mug to warm it up. Mind if I sit down? She asked without looking. I inquired. Aren't there any other booths around here? None. Good. If this one is so special, all yours. While she took off her coat, I picked up my coffee mug and coat and walked to the other end of the restaurant. When I sat down, I looked up. She was already leaving. I guess the booth wasn't that special. After. Neither the coffee nor the food tasted good to me. Have a seat, Jacob, Jonathan said. I sat down. I'm between a hammer and an anvil. A pause occurs. We have the president of the company, two senior vice presidents and their wives coming in next week. They want to stop by here before heading to Vale to go skiing. Naturally, I want to throw a party for them, but I'm in a quandary. As my assistant, you must be invited as a good friend of my wife. Diana must be invited. He looked at me before continuing. It would be best if you bring a date. It would also be nice to have Diana with him as well. Another pause. Are you beginning to see where I'm going with this? Yes, sir, I do. Let's see if I can help you invite Diana in and have her bring her ex. I understand they are close to getting back together if they haven't already. I'll go to the quarry and repair one of the cats, 789, as that will need urgent repairs by then. I'm sure of it. Will that solve your problem? He just looked at me, smiled, and shook his head. Ever since you've been here, you've amazed me with how quickly you grasp things. When I confront you with a problem or task, you always have solid solutions, and you get along with everyone. This is the first time you've made me believe that you're dumber than a truckload of our rocks at some things. The party is at my house next Friday night. Put on a suit and tie and bring a date. Now get back to work. Put on a suit and tie and bring a date. That's what he said. And he meant it. The suit and tie was no problem, but the date. The party was only ten days away. So finding a date was next to impossible. I knew only a few women in town, and none of them were close enough to ask out, especially not to the Whitmore's party. Besides, I had absolutely no idea which of those few women were single or eligible for a date. Jonathan said he was in a quandary. Apparently he wasn't the only one for me. The days went by too fast, and I had no idea about dating. It was Saturday afternoon, and I was in my apartment. I opened the refrigerator door to pull out a package of chili that I had previously taken out of the freezer to defrost. I love chili, and I love cooking it. I look through cookbooks, go online to find different recipes. My last batch was especially good. I took the beer bag out of the fridge and noticed the light bulb was out and the motor wasn't running. I closed the door and reopened it several times, to no avail. I went to the panel and saw that the refrigerator switch was tripped. I reset it, but it shut off again. I tried again with the same result. The beer and chili went back in the fridge. I put on my coat and headed for the hardware store. There were two in town. I had stopped going to the one where David Webster worked, but I had to go there at that time because the other one was closed. I'd never seen it closed on a Saturday afternoon, but this Saturday it was closed. Taking a big breath, I proceeded to Webster's store. I knew what I needed, walked over to where it was, picked out one item and headed for the register.
hoping someone other than Webster's would there. He was, and he was chatting to a man I knew as Diane's father. I'd met him at a gathering at his place, but we hadn't spent much time together. I identified him largely by the mustache he wore. Besides his family, it was his pride and joy. He sang in a barbershop quartet, and all four vocalists had them. I met them at his party. I listened to their chat. I believed I was in good shape, but she stopped talking to me. Webster responded, good for you. Her father stated, you don't deserve a second chance. You made a mistake once, and none of us, especially Diane, believe you would act differently if she gave you another chance. But who is the guy she's dating? Nobody appears to know him, and no one has seen them together. Is he from the town of Leadville? David, this is none of your business. Simply leave her alone. They were talking throughout, finalizing the sale, after she stated, Just leave her alone. Diane's father walked out with his purchase and change without looking back. Webster looked up, saw me, and smiled. It's been a while. How are you? Not bad, I responded. Every time I come here, it appears that you are discussing your romantic life. Do you ever speak about anything else? He gave a laugh. It's a small town. There's not much to discuss. So how about your personal life? I inquired. You were working on getting back with your ex-wife the last time I checked. It's not going well. It appears that she met someone and has a crush on him. Nobody knows who he is and no one has seen him. I remember seeing her at the diner with a man. Perhaps he's from out of town. I said he must be, Webster stated. I finished shopping, returned home, replaced the light, and was relieved to hear my refrigerator humming again. I heated up some chili, drank two beers, looked out the window at the snow falling, and wondered who Diane's new boyfriend was. Not that we had a long-term relationship. I liked her, even though we'd only met a few times. The next day, Sunday, I was doing laundry. My apartment building had only four apartments, and there were no laundry facilities. Every Sunday, I would take my laundry to the laundromat on Main Street, sit down, wash, dry, and fold it. It was always empty when I arrived, and I wondered how it could have survived. One advantage of Sunday drives was that I never had to worry about parking. The street was always deserted until noon, when the church service concluded and people went downtown to eat at the best restaurant in town, which happened to be right next to the laundromat. It wasn't yet noon, and my truck stood out like an eyesore, as it always did on Sunday mornings when there were no other cars around. I was on my phone, reading the news, when I heard the door open. I looked up and noticed her. I went back to my phone. When I heard her footsteps approaching, I looked up again. She sat in the cheap plastic chair next to me. Before she spoke, we exchanged a few brief stares. I wanted to leave, but didn't want to leave my laundry behind. At least, that was what I told myself. Even though it was ridiculous, I believe we could help each other. She began with the question I had asked. Jonathan and Amber are throwing a party on Friday. I know, we're both invited. I also know they want us both to go on dates. Why don't we forget our differences for a few days and travel together? I contemplated for a few seconds. So, what about David? So what about him? I assumed you two were getting back together. Won't he be jealous? To be honest, he's not the type of guy to bring to a party like this, if you know what I mean. I listened to her and found myself siding with David. What exactly do you mean? How long has he been your husband? It has been three years. I bet you accompanied him everywhere. He lived in the same house as you and attended several Whitmore's parties. Suddenly, he's not good enough. That's really sad. I know he cheated on you, but he's trying to get you back. Perhaps this party is his chance to prove to you that he has changed. Let me get this right. Do you believe I should go with David? I honestly don't know, but I doubt you'll join me. She just looked at me, stood up, and walked away. Such a butthole. I was thinking. The lady made an offer to speak with you, and you with your foolish pride keep pushing her away. It's incredibly stupid. I jumped up and charged after her. Diana? Diana, please wait. She had her hand on the doorknob and was about to leave, but she paused. I went over to her. She said, I, Jacob, come on, get it out. But it had better be good. I started. I'm not sure how your relationship with David is, so if I do something inappropriate, I'm sure you'll let me know. But there you have it. I took a deep breath in. Laura cheated me. David has cheated on you. I do not intend to return to Laura. She appears content with her coach. However, David appears eager to reconcile with you. I understand because after a few dates with you, I grew to like you more and more. 
Then you and I had planned a date, but you canceled, citing a prior commitment. That is what I accepted. Then I learned you were dating your ex-husband, and you told me you were good friends. I spoke with him, and he said he was attempting to reconcile with you, and that you had spent some very pleasant evenings together. He hinted, but did not explicitly state, that these evenings included a variety of entertainments, particularly for his birthday. Then yesterday I overheard him and your father talking about your new out-of-town boyfriend. Your father instructed him to stay away from you. I spoke with David after your father left, and I had the impression that he would not give up trying to get you back, despite what your father has said. So here I am, torn between your ex-husband, new boyfriend, and the guy I saw you with at the restaurant. I don't know whether to get my button gear or scratch my watch, and you suggested that we attend a party together. I was hoping you and I would get something out of our relationship, but I won't share, and I only compete if I understand the rules of the game, but there don't appear to be any rules with you, so I will not participate. So here I am, unsure of what to do. We'd returned to the cheap plastic chairs and taken a seat. She grabbed my hands in hers. Did you really mean when you said you liked me more and more? She inquired. Yes, and if there was no ex-husband or new guy from out of town, would you come to the party with me? I'd love to. What time will you pick me up? Or should I just meet you there? What exactly do you mean? I mean, I have no plans to return to David's place. The three nights we spent together after the divorce were entirely about the divorce. He tried to talk me out of paying alimony, but I wouldn't listen. I do not want any of his money, but I swear to God that he will pay until I marry, or if I do it again. I canceled our date because I wanted to convince him that we were over, and I assure you that nothing has happened between us since the divorce. I don't care what he's suggesting. To be honest, I'd completely forgotten that our last meeting was on his birthday, so I assumed you and I would spend many more evenings together. My father was the person you saw me with at the restaurant. We have dinner at least once a month. As for my out-of-town boyfriend, you are you, him, or whatever English language you speak. Are there any questions? Overall, there are about three dozen. You can start asking them tonight at dinner. In the meantime, your laundry is dry and ready to be folded. Would 630 at my house be acceptable to you? That would be ideal, I said, twirling my hair like a wind-up. Okay, I'll see you then. She kissed me, then took two steps back before kissing me again. This kiss lingered longer. I enjoy kissing you, she said as she walked away. I watched her walk away, marveling at the recent turn of events. I was also amazed at my own stupidity. Why hadn't I contacted her a month ago? Sometimes men are incredibly stupid. Dinner that evening was unforgettable. At the very least, the food was unforgettable and nearly perfect. It would have been ideal if it ended with dancing in bed. But that didn't happen. Jonathan asked me on Thursday if I had a date for the party. I assured him I did. That's good because I believe Diana also has one. But I'm expecting you both to be on your best behavior. Okay, I believe we'll be fine. I said it with a smile. On Friday night, I parked in her driveway. There were two limousines parked on the street in front of Jonathan and Amir's house, as well as several other cars. I rang Diane's doorbell and smiled when she answered. She invited me in as she removed her shawl. She was wearing the world-famous LBD dress that every woman on the planet owns and looks amazing in. Wow. It was all I could say when I saw her. Jonathan opened the door for us and she smiled. His eyes grew large. Are you guys together? Diana leaned in and kissed me right then. He looked at us both. He smiled and said, I will take that as a yes. I was pleased when he introduced me as his assistant to the three powerful men and their wives. The president even mentioned that I had secretly swindled them out of two new trucks. Yes, sir, I answered. Have you seen the number since then? He smiled and confirmed. I have. It was a long, enjoyable evening. The honorees boarded their limousines and departed by midnight. Diane and I were the last ones out at 2 a.m. Amber finally admitted to Jonathan that she was aware of my relationship with Diana. She simply wanted to watch him squirm. We laughed about it. I accompanied Diane home. We kissed goodnight at her door as the night grew late. She made no effort to invite me in. I received a call from my lawyer informing me that the divorce hearing for Laura and I would be held on April 7th. He asked if I'd be there the last time he asked. I said I probably wouldn't. 
This is the time. I responded that I would. My relationship with Diane was improving, but love wasn't happening. I was making no moves in that direction, and neither was she. On the day of the trial, I sat with my attorney. Laura did not show up, but her attorney was present. Where is she now? The judge inquired. Are you in Wisconsin? Her attorney replied. Why isn't she here? She's participating in an Ironman competition. What's that? Her lawyer elaborated. Did she decide that was more important than now? I am unable to answer that question, Your Honor. The judge said, I think I can. Before I knew it, I was divorced. Laura received only the money. I abandoned her. The lawyer shook my hand and told me I'd be single in a few weeks. I spent a few days with my family, during which we learned on the local news that Laura Wagner, a local resident, had been disqualified at the end of the swimming portion of an Ironman race in Wisconsin. Mrs. Wagner, who finished 1297 out of 1300, dropped her towel in the area where she used to transition from swimming to cycling after arguing with one of the judges about an equipment mix-up. Her coach, Jason Hendricks, who was once an Ironman competitor, picked it up and handed it to her. Mrs. Wagner was immediately disqualified by an unidentified official, citing a rule that prohibits participants from being aided or assisted in any way. Mrs. Wagner became so enraged that she blamed and attacked Mr. Hendricks. She was immediately arrested and detained in Wisconsin pending trial. Mr. Hendricks went home immediately, promising to return for Mrs. Wagner's trial. Mrs. Wagner's bicycle was examined, and it was discovered that the gears were defective. Mrs. Wagner blamed this on Mr. Hendricks, who has been barred from competing in any sanctioned competition for the rest of his life. He was also stripped of his license to train athletes with the intention of competing in Ironman. I burst out laughing. Almost two years of training. A divorce has occurred. It's an affair. There have been rumors of an abortion. In her first race, she finished 1,297th out of 1,300 participants. She didn't need the bikes after all. When I drove there from the Denver airport, there was a blizzard in Leadville. I contacted Diane while I was gone, so she was aware of Laura's divorce and disqualification. I came to a stop in front of my house, grabbed my bag, and entered. Someone jumped on me just as I was about to enter my house. Diana was the name. She dragged me to the front door and assisted me in unlocking it. We then piled onto the couch in the living room. Good day. Please wait a minute. Let me catch my breath. I replied, Certainly not, mister. She spoke. Are you currently divorced? Yeah, this is what we got into. Sun Tzu, a Chinese military strategist, wrote The Art of War in the 5th Century B.C. The book described aspects of warfare after a week spent with Diana. My ideas about being loved and loving shifted, and I began mentally drafting an outline for The Art of Love, the world's best book on love, which I dedicated to her. Diana and I share similar feelings. When she was near me, my heart would race and a smile would spread across my face. We married a year later. It was a gorgeous day. It was clear, warm, and mountainous. No, absolutely not, just like the previous year. It took some time to adjust to the mountain weather. My family arrived shortly before the wedding ceremony. My father approached me and asked if I wanted to know what happened to Laura. Not especially. But I believe you are going to tell me anyway, I informed him. You are aware of what happened in Wisconsin, correct? She launched an attack on him. Yeah, I was aware of that. She received a six-month jail sentence. It. When she got out, she returned to town, but no one wanted to deal with her. Not even Jimi Hendrix. He worked in the same gym where they exercised. However, as a regular trainer, he could not promote himself as an official Ironman coach. She went back to her old job because she is very knowledgeable about computers. Anyway... She lost interest in training, with the exception of the annual 4th of July hot dog eating contest. My godson must have earned pound 50. I burst out laughing. The world was in its orbit, and I was about to marry the love of my life. Diana and I had seen her all over town, but we had never spoken with him. We'd been married nearly a year when I needed to go to the hardware store. By that time, we had one of the large home improvement stores that are found throughout the country. He was, of course, reselling items that were too small to be sold in local stores, which were forced to close. I went to the store to get new belts for my sander. I was selecting what I needed. When someone tapped on my shoulder, I made a turn around. It was Diane's former partner, 
Mr. David Webster. Welcome, stranger, he spoke. Hi, I replied. How are you? Not that awful. He wore a vest with the name of the store on it. Do you work here currently? I inquired. Yeah, it's the sole game in town. The pay is reasonable and the benefits are excellent. Good. I spoke. I have everything I need, so I'll go. He touched my arm, causing me to stop. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this essay, please like it and subscribe, if you haven't already. If you have a story to tell about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Please take care.